Hello, welcome back. Now that we've got a sort of a basic understanding of uh, how friction works and how it might affect our systems, I just want to talk about at quite a high level um, uh, some common methods for friction compensation. Um, and really the main message today uh, is that friction is really annoying and ultimately the, the best piece of advice, I think, or the most general piece of advice that can be given is try and get rid of it. I mean, there are exceptions. Some systems you want to use friction to your advantage, like braking in cars or that kind of thing. But in general, friction is a real pain. And the best thing that you can do is work really hard to get rid of it. So sort of the number one piece of advice for how to deal with friction is uh, get rid of it as best you can. And by this, we mean things like keeping all of your components or all of your uh, joints well lubricated. So lubrication is key. Um, cleaning, um, sort of wherever you have a source of friction, just try and lubricate and clean to the point where friction forces become as small as possible. Um, nothing that you can do with control is really going to compete with just attempts to eliminate friction. Uh, that said, you'll never be able to eliminate it perfectly, and this is really where these kinds of techniques that I'm now going to describe might come in handy. But uh, yeah, there's, as with everything, there's no miracle solutions to anything here. The first thing you should try and do is just use your common sense and get rid of the friction. Don't just assume that uh, all of these advanced control techniques will help overcome this problem. Just get rid of it. Um, so to talk about um, methods for friction compensation, I just want to return to our simple picture here where we have some mass that's experiencing some velocity dependent friction. Um, and when we introduced this before, we talked about these common models of friction in which the friction force was dependent on the velocity. And we sort of said that curves that look something like this, or maybe they go off, um, something like this, are, are quite common. So we have this effect where for very low velocities, uh, you have this sort of static friction. And eventually, when you finally get things moving, um, you, and you enter this dynamic regime, your friction forces drop off again. And this was the Strybeck effect. And then eventually, as the velocity increases, maybe your friction forces start to come back up again. Um, and we're just going to give sort of very high level advice for how to deal with this uh, nonlinearity. And it's going to be sort of split into two cases. Um, so really, when dealing with friction, this sort of regime where you're operating things at low velocities or velocities that are changing sign a lot, this is the really difficult, uh, messy situation to arrive in. This is where you have to really confront this static friction. So you you might be operating your equipment so that the velocity is zero, and then you try and get moving again, and you've got to overcome this static friction. You might have this sort of stop-start effect that, um, or this stiction effect that we were talking about before. And this is really annoying, and it's really difficult to model with any accuracy. And this makes it very difficult to compensate for with control methods. If you don't have good models for what's going on, then it's difficult to come up with clever control strategies to overcome it. So we've got this sort of difficult low velocity regime, or then we've got um, the situation where maybe you're operating your equipment at high velocities the whole time. Um, and we'll just sort of talk about some common tactics for dealing with these two regimes. We'll do this regime first. So I'll call this operating regime one. Um, so if we're in regime one, so what's the issue? Uh, the issue is that we have some disturbance friction force, if you like, and it it's sort of varies in its magnitude depending on the velocity we're at. Um, but it, you can see it's not really varying that much. Um, so quite a simple way to go about dealing with um, these types of friction forces to prevent them wrecking your behavior is to treat them as disturbances and design your controllers to eliminate them. So 
when you're in regime one, maybe a common strategy for dealing with friction is to treat as external constant disturbance or slowly varying disturbance. Constant slash slowly varying. And so what's the natural way to deal with this? Well, you have already learned about control architectures that are very good at rejecting constant disturbances or slowly varying disturbances. And that control strategy is integral action. So a very good way to start to deal with friction uncertainty in this regime um, is to use integral action. And we've got a few extra details in the lecture notes um, for maybe slight modifications in how you would implement your integral action. Um, but the, this is the general idea, is in this regime we have some friction disturbance, it's not changing that much, and integral action is a good control technique for eliminating constant um, unknown disturbances. Uh, so that's a good thing that you can do um, to deal with friction when you're operating in regime one. Another thing that you can try to do is you can try and build up friction models. As we said, it's very difficult to model friction in this regime. I mean, it's still hard, it's, it's hard to model friction in general, but um, I, I would say uh, maybe it's a bit easier in this regime here. And if that's the case, then we can just try and cancel it out. So we can put in a friction model. Uh, so we have some, we, we measure our velocity, we have some model for the friction force that will be being applied. And then if we just modify our control input, uh, we can try and just cancel out the effect of friction. So we try and compensate for friction by predicting what it will be and opposing it. Um, and again, that we give a, a simple adaptive scheme um, for, for doing this, but friction modeling is hard, so you need to be quite careful when you start um, using this kind of uh, technique, because if your model here isn't a very good match for what's actually going on with friction, well, maybe by adding this signal in, you'll just make things worse or make your system behave in wild and unpredictable ways. Um, so we can treat it as an external disturbance, or we can estimate and cancel. So that's uh, operating regime one. How about this uh, slightly annoying region uh, where you have these high stiction forces? So if we're in regime two, or we need to operate in regime two, a common tactic here is to introduce uh, what's called a dither signal, and the purpose of this dither signal is to try and prevent us from ever operating on this um, on this part of the curve here. So we might be operating in this region here, but we'll just try and prevent ourselves ever actually having zero velocity. Um, or if we do, we'll try and push ourselves away very quickly, and that's what the dither signal is supposed to do. So you add dither and this is just a high frequency kind of, I don't know, it's sort of like a disturbance. We, you, you add it yourself, so it's not something that you don't know, it's something that you're deliberately applying, and the purpose of this disturbance is to try and prevent you from ever having zero velocity for very long, so to try and prevent these stiction forces from kicking in. So we add in a disturbance here, Call it. I'll call it D, and this is our dither signal. What's some common choices for a dither signal? Um, well, maybe the simplest thing that you could apply for your dither signal is just some kind of triangle wave or square wave, high frequency, and the amplitude should be big enough to try and just knock your system so that it never settles down to having zero velocity. And so you're sort of just shaking yourself around here to prevent this stiction effect. Um, this is not the only choice. Uh, there's a, an innovation developed here in Lund. There's something called the knocker is develop, developed by uh, Tore Haglund, who you may have been lectured by before. And um, 
in this he was proposing um, to add dither signals that also try and take into account some reference signal information. So th this is very naive, you're just sort of shaking back and forth. Um, you're not taking any into account how you actually want to operate your system. By being a bit more sophisticated, um, you could take some of that into account. and So maybe you might be better off applying some signal that, that looks something like this. Where the, the trend in this curve is supposed to represent where you're trying to drive the system. Um, so you've got a few choices for how you make your dither signals look. Um, and that, at least, is a very brief introduction to how you might uh, go about dealing with uh, friction through feedback. Um, but don't forget, just try and get rid of it uh, first and foremost.